Hi guys. Hey guys. So while we were searching this topic, and it's a complex one, yes, we mostly came across criticism of bad female representation, but we wanted to take a more constructive approach and share with you examples of good representation. So even if you haven't seen the films or books that we talk about, stick around because we think it's truly a video for everyone. And it starts in three, two, one. For me, storytelling goes beyond entertainment. It's like Joan Didion famously wrote, we tell ourselves stories in order to live. And a story can't exist without characters. A story is the characters. And even the most minor ones should be depicted with emotional depth. Characters are what made me fall in love with Mike Mills' brilliant 20th century women. Just be there. Somehow that's hard for all of you. No, I'm not, I'm not all men. Okay, I'm just me. Well, yes and no. Watching the film, I was struck by the cast of characters. They seemed so real and fully formed, alive, and they were written with such depth and insight, most notably the women. In terms of female on-screen representation, this was miles above the unidimensional sidekick or the love interest who lacks any self-determination. There was no doubt in my mind, This was a feminist film. Mike Mills is married to a fellow feminist, artist, filmmaker, and author, Miranda July. Her own body of work features an abundance of characters who don't conform to the norm. Her latest novel, The First Batman, is no exception. In this video, we'll take a closer look at how feminism affects storytelling by examining Mike Mills and Miranda July's very unique artistic outputs. Don't you need a man to raise a man? No, I don't think so. That's the premise of Mike Mills' 20th Century Women, in a nutshell. Loosely biographical, the film tells the story of Dorothea, a single mother who raises her teenage son, Jamie, in 1970s California. But even though it's based on Mills' experiences of growing up with women, the young boy is not the focus of the film. The son's a vehicle to see the mother and the other women, to see the Greta Gerwig character and the Elle character. And he's like a catalyst. Things happen because of him, but he's not the protagonist. The other women are Abby and Julie, played by Greta Gerwig and Elle Fanning. Thanks to nuanced performances by the whole cast, Annette Benning in particular, and a choice made by Mills to give every character a biographical voiceover monologue, we are privy to these transcending human portrayals of women. It's 1979, I'm 55 years old, and this is what my son believes in. These people, with this hair and these clothes, making these gestures, making these sounds, Early on in the film, Dorothea enlists Abby and Julie to help shape her son into a man since the dad is more or less out of the picture. Initially, the script featured the absent father, but he was cut out of it after Mills discussed it with July, who said, It's a hackneyed. It's making your movie about women really about a man. Finding her input brutal at first, he eventually came to realize that she was right. I'm raised in a matriarchy, so women have power. Women are who are exciting. Women are who have agency and are just the thing you need. The result is a film rich with artistic value that presents women in all their paradoxical glory, sometimes brave, sometimes fragile, always loving. And the men are just as many-sided with characters that have an openness to experience. With his film, Mike Mills shows us the value of having male filmmakers producing resonant feminist cinema. Come way, the mountains There's no normal in Miranda July's body of work. They came back and they petted me and I accidentally made the sound that means I am cat which is belonging to you. And while some people might dismiss it as being quirky for quirky's sake, 
I've always found that her refusal to conform was one of her greatest strengths. Every one of her unconventional characters captures your imagination because they're not like any other character you've ever known. Here's a synopsis of July's novel, The First Bad Man. A middle-aged woman who lives alone with all of her hang-ups is forced to take in this young, blonde bombshell. At first, they have a very antagonistic, violent relationship. Then, the relationship changes. They somehow become friends. Then the relationship changes again. One of them has a child. The two women decide to raise the child together. Then, the relationship changes again. They start sharing a beautiful sexual intimacy and they become passionate lovers. And then the relationship changes again. They split, one of the women leaves and the other stays to raise the child. It's all described in touching detail by the deeply imaginative mind of Miranda July. Interviewed by Carrie Brownstein in Interview Magazine, she talks about the book's gender dynamics. Much of the book is about the fantasy world and about how gender is up for grabs in your own secret fantasy life. Like people who would not be using the word gender or thinking about gayness or transness may actually, without even thinking about it, be not their own gender in their inner world. So I was trying to go as far as I could with exploring that without ever using the politicizing words that we're used to. July's attempt to explore these concepts apolitically is what sets the novel apart. It's an experience in openness and imagination. If Mike Mills' film was a love letter to women, Miranda July's work is a deep dive into the feminine mind and into the human mind as a whole. Now, representation of women in fiction is a feminist issue that's been around for a long time. Dink, meet Felix Leiter. Hello. Felix, say hello to Dink. Hi, Dink. Dink, say goodbye to Felix. Hmm? Uh, man talk. Virginia Woolf addressed it in her 1929 essay, A Room of One's Own. All the great women of fiction were, until Jane Austen's day, not only seen by the other sex, but seen only in relation to the other sex. But this concern gained even more traction when a certain comic strip from the 80s, critical of the cinematic landscape, started circulating. In Alison Bechdel's series, Dykes to Watch Out For, the rule shows us two women having a conversation at the movies. One of them explains her requirements when choosing what film to see. One, it has to have at least two women in it. Two, who talk to each other. Three, about something besides a man. This came to be known as the Bechdel test. Its popularity reached an all-time high in the 2010s. The idea behind it seemed to articulate something that society was starting to criticize. Women are underrepresented in popular culture, and most of the female characters who do make it on the screen lack depth and diversity. Then again, the Bechdel test is by no means an exact metric by which to analyze gender representation, but it has inspired cinephiles to look at film more critically. And because of it, new methodologies are continuously invented so that the debate becomes less about rhetoric and more about factual data. So why is it all so important? Underrepresentation causes a ripple effect. In her essay, author Julia T. Wood posits that this constant distortion tempts us to believe that there really are more men than women, and further, that men are the cultural standard. For an audience, limited points of view can perpetuate stereotypes and fail to provide us with transformative models of womanhood. But more and more, there seem to be conscious efforts made towards reaching some kind of balance. We're giving a seat at the table to people who have long been silenced into an existence. The result? Refreshingly rich and unique portraits. Stories that are told differently. Making the Deuce, a show that takes a deep dive into the world of sex workers, showrunner David Simon said that it was crucial for him to work with women. Wanting to expand the show's point of view, he hired female writers, directors, producers, and crew. Simon said, it could be a boy's version of this topic. That would be a disaster ethically and artistically. And even though there are very few studio executives who aren't men, the spotlight is now on the growing diversity in filmmaking, and it can only be seen as a sign of hope, a sign of change. Stories, with all of their moral ramifications, have the power to inform the opinions that we form, the choices that we make, and the actions that we take. The more varied these stories are, the more we can learn about the wide spectrum of human experience. Thanks for watching. If you like, please subscribe. And you can also like, comment, share. You can support us on Patreon. And see you next month. Yeah. Bye <laughs> Thanks. Bye. bye.